There's a story in the Old Testament. Remember when the children of Israel, the people of God, went and retrieved the Ark of God. And uh, they did it the incorrect way the first time. And someone died because of it. But then Obed-Edom got the Ark and he said, put it in my house. And uh, his house became blessed. His house became favored because of God's presence, which is what the Ark represents. We have a covenant relationship today with God because of Jesus, what the ark foreshadowed, uh, the presence of God that would come because of Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, Obed-Edom had a little bit of an idea that this would be a good thing. And how many believe this morning it would be a good thing to have the presence of the Lord, amen? Not just to have another church service, but to actually have His presence here. And so let's welcome Him. He responds to faith, amen? Jesus shows up when we're expressing faith in who He is and what He's done for us. His sacrifice on the cross. So let's just take a few moments this morning in prayer and let's express our faith in Jesus and ask Him to move in this service this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to You in Jesus' name. God, we're so grateful for Your presence. Lord, what would we do without Your presence? Where would we be, God, without Your holy presence in our lives? And Lord, we want You to show up in this place this morning. We want You to have Your way in each heart, each life. Lord, we surrender our hearts to You. We believe that what You did on the cross was more than enough to meet our needs today. God, I just pray that we can praise you, that we can worship you from our hearts in sincerity and truth today. God, that as we do that, that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, would move among us, reveal truth to us, let us leave different than we came in a good way because of what you would do by your Spirit. We'll just give you glory and praise for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. <laughs>
thank you for rescuing us today. God, from the world, the flesh, the devil. God, putting us in our right mind, saving us, making us ready for heaven, giving us life and life more abundantly. God, we worship you for that today. We thank you that we're covered by the blood. The enemy cannot touch us because of the blood of Jesus today. We're protected. We're provided for. Lord, we just give you glory for that this morning. We give you praise. Hallelujah.
will be answered. Amen. It will be worth it to see Jesus. Praise the Lord.
you this morning. God, you're what our life is all about today, God. If it weren't for you, God, we would not even be in existence. God, you hold us together by your word, by your power. Lord, we worship you this morning. We pray that you'll accept our praise. Our worship has a sweet sound in your ear this morning. We pray it's blessed you. God, let our hearts this morning be fertile soil for the seed of the word of God to follow. God, I pray we would see a 100-fold harvest in our lives today. Growth, maturity, momentum. God, your spirit pushing us forward, God, into progress. What you want us to become, both as individuals, as families, and as a church. Just have your way in this place this morning. We yield our hearts to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Overcome 
or are you an overcomer? We're going to look at uh, several verses in the book of Revelation. We've seen in seven, di seven different messages over the last several services that God wants us to be an overcomer. Amen? He wants us to be more than a conqueror. As Christians in America today, we're not to just barely get by. We're just not to keep our head, just have enough to keep our head above water. We're to triumph in Christ. That's what God has destined for you. And sometimes unbelief, or as Zoe just sang about fear, comes from the enemy and tries to steal the best that God has for us. And I hope in these seven messages that we've looked, looked at, that you see God's will for you is not to judge you. He's not up there trying to punish you and chastise you all the time. He has life and life more abundantly for you. He wants you to triumph. He wants you to live life at its fullest within his framework, of course. But he has a plan for you to be an overcomer and not to be overcome this morning. Uh, I want us to look at a couple of quotes before we get into the scripture. Most of us have heard of Michael Jordan, right? Probably, arguably the greatest of all time. Ever played the game of basketball? He said this, obstacles don't have to stop you. If you run into a wall, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it. Go through it or work around it. Perseverance. We need that in our lives as believers, don't we? Sometimes we're going to hit the wall and fall down. We're going to have something uh, overwhelm us that we didn't expect in our life. And how do we respond to that? Do we just give up? Do we just surrender and quit? Or do we believe God and say, God, I know this was devastating. I didn't know where this was coming from. But God, help me to get back up. Help me to trust you. Help me to believe you. We need that kind of faith. Look at this quote, this next quote. If you're going to fight the good fight of faith to the finish, you'll have to do just like Joshua did. You'll have to continually draw courage from the Word of God. I hope you're doing that. Get into that Word and let it change you from a coward to an overcomer. Then march into the battle and slay the giants in your land. Remember Joshua and Caleb were two among twelve who said yes. Why did they say yes? Because they had heard God's Word and God's Word was yes. You can take the land. Yes, I have promised you this possession. Yes, I am with you and I will help you. You can stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. God's saying the same thing to us today. And maybe most of our society, maybe even most of the church world is saying, Oh, but those giants are awful big. There's some problems there. And they're speaking down on unbelief. God's just looking for a few people like Joshua and Caleb, who will hear God's word constantly, not just once a long time ago, but daily. God, I've got to hear your voice. And then move in faith to what God says to us. We need a church like that, amen, in these last days, a remnant that Jesus is coming back for, a, a people who have a fierce faith, who will believe God in the face of adversity, in the face of the rest of the crowd saying we should go a different way. No, I'm going to believe God. And I'm going to press forward. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be the overcomer that God wants me to be. The Lord Jesus Christ, He didn't leave heaven. He didn't come to earth as a man. He didn't live a life of perfect example and perfect obedience, including going to the cross as our perfect sacrifice so that we could continue to be overcome by the world, the flesh, and the devil. He didn't do all those things. All those things are in vain if we live an overcome life. But they're what Jesus did so that we could be an overcomer. Amen? He lived a perfect example. He went to the cross, paid sin's penalty so that we could be free and be the overcomer. Jesus accomplished a finished work at Calvary to give us everything that we need for life and godliness. He, he went to the cross to share his victory and his inheritance and glory with us. You're a joint heir with Jesus today if you're walking by faith. In other words, God wants you, He wants me to be an overcomer. And I hope you see that in these verses that we look at today. Are you overcome this morning? Or do you understand who you are in Christ and that you are an overcomer? That's how God sees you. Satan may call you by your sin, but God calls you by your name. You are an overcomer and He calls your name. Amen? 
We need to believe that today. What does Revelation, the book of Revelation, teach us about being an overcomer through Christ? Number one, I want us to see there are nine rewards that the book of Revelation talks about. The Word of God talks about nine rewards for the overcomer. And you should want these rewards. Amen? If God has a reward, you should want it. <laughs> you should, oh, that's for somebody else. No, you should want it. And these are nine rewards that God says are available to the overcomer. Not being overcome by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and instead living the life of an overcomer only happens by placing our faith exclusively in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and then keeping it there. So if you do that, then you can have these rewards. Place your faith in who the Bible says Jesus is. Place your faith daily in what the Bible says He accomplished for you at Calvary. And then you can have these nine rewards. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Look at that verse with me, if you will. Revelation 2, verse 7. It says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Sin had prevented Adam and Eve from continuing to reside in the Garden of Eden. We know the story, don't we? Genesis chapter 3. This was a manifestation of the mercy of God because He did not want people to continue forever in their lost and fallen state. Jesus paid the penalty for sin, though, when He went to Calvary. And so now we can eat of the tree of life. Jesus gave us access to eternal life. Amen? To everlasting life. God, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, be in the process of dying without Jesus, but you should have everlasting life. Amen? God wants you to partake of that everlasting life that He's made available. And that's a reward of the overcomer. If you'll look to Jesus, look to the cross, the reward is you're going to get to eat and partake of the tree of life, everlasting life that Jesus has made available. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. The second reward that the book of Revelation says is available to the overcomer. He that has an ear, reach up and feel them. Are they there? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. And the second death here in verse 11 refers to the lake of fire, place of final judgment where all the unsaved will be banished forever and forever. Revelation 21 8. That's a good reward, isn't it? I'm not going to be touched by the second death. The devil can threaten you with all kinds of things, but he can't threaten you with the lake of fire if you're an overcomer like God has destined you to be. You keep your faith in Jesus. You keep your faith in His finished work. You will overcome the punishment that's coming for Satan and his fallen angels. Number three, Revelation 2.17. A third reward that the book of Revelation says is available to those who are overcomers. Revelation 2.17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in, the, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. Alright? And what is he saying in this verse? There's some kind of symbolism. Revelation sometimes has some symbolism in it. Sometimes it's literal. And so we have to have the help of the Holy Spirit, don't we? We have to have the help of the context of what we're reading to know whether God means it to be figurative and symbolic or whether he means it to be literal. The best way to interpret the book of Revelation, most scholars would tell you, who, who love God's word, who know God's word, is to take as much literally as you can. And if God means it to be symbolic or figurative, you'll know from the context, and the Holy Spirit will bear witness to it. Amen? Does that make sense? And so you see a little bit of symbolic figuratism or things that we don't necessarily understand. It means in this verse that we will never be without spiritual sustenance. We'll eat of the hidden manna. Think of in the Old Testament when God provided the manna for the children of Israel in the wilderness. Did they do anything to make that manna show up other than believe God? No. God just provided it to them once a day like He said. He provided an extra amount on the sixth day so that they wouldn't have to gather the food on the Sabbath. They could rest in God. 
And we rest in Jesus today. We don't rest in a day. We rest in Jesus. But God provides us hidden manna, spiritual food, spiritual sustenance, if we'll just like the children of Israel, just simply believe God and take Him at His word. This phrase relates to the social and ju judicial customs of that day. A host would give a white stone only to an invited guest. Also, a white stone was often presented in a courtroom as a sign of acquittal, innocence. God says, I'm going to give you a white stone if you're an overcomer. That's a good thing. Amen? You may not understand all that the stone represents, but it's a good thing. I think we can at least get that. Conversely, a black stone meant condemnation. Both of these promises relate to the intimate relationship that exists between the Lord and the person who has chosen to follow Him. We're going to have favor, amen? Not only in this life, but we're going to have favor in the life to come. When others are being judged, we're going to have a white stone. We're going to have a new name, and it's probably the name of our Messiah, isn't it? Jesus Christ, written across our lives. Like a potter who crafts something on the potter's wheel, and right before they put it, right before they glaze it, right before they put it into the oven, what do they do? If it's their own and they're happy with it, they put their name on it. If they're not happy with it, they may not put their name on it, right? But God is happy with His creation. How do we know that? He said... In Genesis, it is good, right? It is good. He saw his creation and said it's good. That means he wrote his name across our hearts. And so we have a name written across us if we're an overcomer, and it's the name of Jesus. We belong to him. We ought to rejoice in that. The next reward of the overcomer, Revelation 2, 26 through 28. He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. What is this talking about? This is talking about, again, the last days, the end times. The Greek word translated power is exousia, and it signifies authority. To the overcomer will be given the right to exercise authority over the nations, but under Christ. This all has to do with the coming kingdom age, which will commence with the second coming. Revelation chapters 19 and 20 talk about that. Satan and all of his demon spirits, along with fallen angels, will be locked away during that time, that thousand year reign. And it's actually a time frame of some thousand years in the bottomless pit. Jesus Christ will then rule personally from Jerusalem, right here on the earth, with Israel then having accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Master as well as Messiah, and thereby they will be restored to their place of position and rulership. We know that about Israel. They will judge the nations. But again, it will all be under Christ. As well, every glorified saint, that's me and you, we're Gentiles. I don't know that anybody in here is Jewish, right? By descent. We're Gentiles, but we have a place in this promise as well if we're an overcomer. Every glorified Satan who has ever lived will help Christ rule the nations at that time and will help administer his government. We know the verse in Isaiah, the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The first time ever there will actually be real peace. When Jesus begins to rule. So the, other, the overcomer has a reward of we're going to rule and reign under Christ but with him and judge the nations. And we ought to look forward to God uh, putting us in that role. Revelation 3 verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, white clothing. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. What does that mean? If he will not blot your name out of the book of life, what's possible? It's possible that your name is written there, and it's possible that he can blot it out or he wouldn't have mentioned it, right? So there goes once saved, always saved, right? That's not a, a correct doctrine. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He, God, will not blot out, or he will blot out the names of people who denigrate their personal experiences with God by exchanging them for vain religious Formality. If all you want is religion that you can control, your name won't be in the book of life. Religion kills and has for many, many hundreds of years. Whatever price overcomers have to pay to stay faithful to Christ, it will be worth it 
when he announces their names to the Father before all the angels in heaven. What a reward. This one is mine. Amen. This one may not have been perfect. They may have had some stumblings and some falls, but they never stopped trusting in my son, my one and only beloved son who died in their place. And they're an overcomer, and he'll be boasting about, about your name before the angels in heaven. What a reward. Revelation 3, verse 12. He that overcomes, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. And we have to understand again what this verse is talking about. There's some symbolism that the old covenant believers would have understood, the Jews would have understood. But maybe as new covenant believers, we don't understand today. Solomon's temple had two pillars in the front of it. And they didn't hold anything up. They were there for decoration. And that's the pillars that he's talking about in this verse. There were going to be a pillar in the temple of our God. There were two pillars which sat in the front of the temple. To understand some things about these two pillars, we will understand more so what Jesus was speaking about. First of all, the names of the two pillars were Jachin, which stood on the right as one faces the temple, and Boaz, which stood on the left. Jachin means he shall establish, and Boaz means in, in it is strength. So the two together mean he shall establish it in strength. These were the two pillars in Solomon's temple. These two pillars, as I said, really didn't hold up anything as pillars normally do. They were strictly for ornamentation, not support or load-bearing pillars. There's a message in that. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said. Learn of me. I am meek and lowly and you find rest. God didn't create man because God needed man. These pillars were made of brass. And as the sun shone on them, they were exceedingly bright. We as believers are to shine brightly, but not because of any brilliance on our part, but rather to be a reflection of the sun. S-O-N. Jesus Christ. We're to be a reflection of the sun. We are merely ornamentation. Because we have been washed in the blood, God publicly and even ostentatiously owns us. And he says, you're going to be a pillar. You're going to be a place for my glory to shine in my temple in heaven, in the new Jerusalem. Isn't that awesome? He's not ashamed of you. You are a trophy of his grace. He wants to show you off. He doesn't need you for support. Amen? You're, the work of God doesn't all hinge on you. Thank God, because we make mistakes, right? The best of us. But he wants you to be a trophy of his grace. He wants you to be a reflection of Christ's glory. Like an artist proudly puts their name on their masterpiece work of art, God writes his name upon those who accept Jesus and his finished work on the cross. This one is mine. Amen? That's a promise, a reward to the overcomer. Revelation 3, 21. We can see the next reward. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in His throne, sharing in the reign of Christ over this earth, just as He shares in the glory that belongs to the Father. What an honor, isn't it? That God would choose us. That if we just simply keep believing, overcoming by faith, He's going to place us in a position of honor like this. Where He sits on His throne in glory, we're going to sit with Him. Revelation 21, 7. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Relationship, right? Nothing better than relationship with God. If you have the gift, sometimes the gift wears out, doesn't it? Sometimes the gift, the batteries go dead. Sometimes the gift goes out of style, right? And you need a new gift. But if you always have the gift giver then you always have the gifts that you need. Amen? Which one do you prefer? Would you rather have the gifts or would you rather have the gift giver? I'd rather have the gift giver. Amen? And that's what God's saying in this verse. You have covenant love relationship with me. I am your heavenly father and you are my son or daughter. It means inheritance, right? It's implied. It means provision. It means protection. It means whatever you need at the moment you need it. Because you're in relationship with God, you're an overcomer. You have everything that you need at all times. 
That ought to give us confidence today. The overcomer is adopted into the family of God. God treats him as a son, exactly as he does his son, Jesus. And we need to rest in that today. Be an overcomer. Amen? That's God's desire. Number two, those were the nine rewards. Hopefully you looked at those and remind yourself of those. Number two, the last thing I want us to look at this morning. The only means of overcoming that the Bible tells us. The only means of overcoming. And it's in Revelation 12, verse 11. Most of us could probably quote this verse. Revelation 12. Verse 11, it says, And they overcame him, talking about the devil and his minions in the last days, the Antichrist, the false prophet, demonic spirits. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto the death. Amen. How will we overcome today? We're not in this chapter 12 yet. Things are going to get really bad during the great tribulation. But the saints in the tribulation will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how we overcome today. By the blood of the Lamb. What Jesus did for us at Calvary. It's what gives us victory. It's the key to our victory today. And by the word of our testimony. God, I'm not going to be afraid or ashamed to speak about how you've healed me about how you've provided for me, about how you've worked miracles, amen? The devil's going to tell us to shut up, stop making so many waves, stop talking about your faith so much, you're making people uncomfortable. That's what he wants. But God's saying, no, you overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Keep your eyes on Jesus and what he did at the cross and then tell others how that's changed your life, amen? Testify, tell other people that that's what they need. They may not accept it, they may reject it, you can't be responsible for that, but sow the seed, amen? Water it, let God bring the increase. And you can not only overcome yourself and have victory yourself and triumph in Christ yourself, you can help others around you to be an overcomer as well. And that's really what God desires. Self-effort doesn't work. Willpower or determination doesn't work as far as helping you overcome. Methods or philosophies of man don't work. We've heard all kinds of things, haven't we, in our lifetime? You know, seven steps of this, twelve habits of that. And you do it all and you're still in no better place than you were. And it's even in the church, sad to say. Methods of man, philosophies of man don't work in helping us overcome. Even man-made religion with all its rituals and ceremonies the wheels in motion can't help the believer overcome. Only Jesus can. Amen. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The Greek word for overcome is the same one Jesus used of his overcoming of Satan. We overcome. We, we win an utter victory. A complete, total devastation of the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we need to get a hold of that. John 16, 33. Jesus said this. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. What does he say? I have overcome the world. Jesus is an overcomer. The worst possible forms of darkness this world has ever known came against Jesus when he went to the cross. And he rose victoriously three days later. They gave the best they had. They thought they had won. Satan thought he had won when Jesus died on the cross. But he found out he was wrong. Amen? And we have that same victory. If we're Christians, we're Christ-like. We have triumph. We have victory in Jesus. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Amen? God wants us to be overcomers. So there will be days, won't there, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, and there's days when I feel overcome. The finances aren't there, things in the family aren't going right, there's issues and circumstances that are just bigger than me. It's going to happen to all of us. But in those moments is when we need to remember what we've been talking about in these messages, amen? God's not brought me to this place to leave me. He's made me an overcomer. Yes, I may be in financial difficulties, but I know God's going to bring me through them. I may be facing family issues and I don't know how to fix them, but God's going to bring me through. Amen? Not placing faith in yourself or in some uh, lesser love, but placing your faith in Jesus and the cross 
that He wants to bring us through. You don't have to believe the devil's lies this morning. You don't have to fall victim to his wicked schemes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, or to immobilize you with fear. You have not been created to be overcome by the world and the flesh and the devil. You have been created for continual victory. Do you believe that? Jesus has created you for continual victory, to be more than a conqueror, to be an overcomer in Jesus. Amen? That's the key, is stay in Christ. If you stay in Christ, you're an overcomer. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and I want to close with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're looking for victory any other place, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be discouraged. But if you understand that your victory comes as a result of the victory that Jesus won at Calvary, you're going to walk in continual victory yourself. Amen? You're going to be the overcomer. Have the rewards that Revelation talks about are available to the overcomer. You're going to begin to experience them even now before the last days uh, begin to unfold. And we ought to believe God for that. Amen? And let the Lord use us to help others be overcomers that come across our path, family members, friends, people that the devil may be lying to and winning and deceiving them. God wants to use us to reach them this morning. Would you stand with me this morning? I want us to close in prayer, time of response to God's Word. Every time God speaks to us, He wants a response. He's looking for an answer. I believe He's looking for an answer from each person that's under the sound of my voice this morning in this room over Facebook Live. And I don't know where you're at, but God does. He loves you anyway. Amen? Even if you're failing Him, God loves you anyway. And He's spoken this word because He's not come to condemn, He's come to save. Amen? Maybe you are overcome by the world, the flesh, and the devil this morning. You're living in sin. You're lost. You're away from God. Maybe you once knew Him. But you know you've made decisions to live in rebellion against God, against His Word. You've walked away from the Lord. The good news is God still loves you today. Amen? He still loves you and He wants to save you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to do what you can't do in your own strength. And that's to forgive your sins. And to cleanse you and make you ready for heaven. And so if you've heard this message this morning and you know, you'd say, Pastor Eric, I know I need to repent. I know I need to tell God I'm sorry for my sins. And to make a 180 degree turn and say, God, I want to run back to you. If that's where you're at this morning, you can look to the cross, you can look to Jesus. And if you give your heart to him, you can begin to see the rewards of the overcomer in your life. Amen. You can live in his favor. You can live in that covenant love relationship where every need is met because you are trusting the Lord. And so if that's what you need to do this morning, if that's the decision you need to make, I want you to pray this prayer with us. Invite Jesus into your heart and life. Let Him forgive your sins. If you've wandered away from Him, God still loves the prodigal son. All He's waiting is for you to get full of all the emptiness of this world and realize it's never going to satisfy you and come running back to Him. And He'll welcome you if you'll come in faith. Would you pray this prayer with me? I'm going to ask those who are here this morning to repeat this prayer after me. Right where you're at, if you need Jesus in your heart this morning, pray this prayer with us. Invite Him into your heart today. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to You in Jesus' name, admitting and acknowledging that I am a sinner. I believe, Jesus, that You died on the cross for my sins, paying the penalty that I deserved. And I am in need of You, Jesus, to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Please forgive me for all my sin. Wash me. Make me clean. And help me from this day forward to live for you. Thank you for saving me and making me ready for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, send us a note, an email, a private message. We want to encourage you your walk with the Lord. Find a church to get plugged into that's preaching the Bible, that's teaching the Word of God. Find some other believers that you can partner with. Get a Bible and start reading in the book of John. Begin to talk to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Let Him speak to you every day. 
God's going to help you to be that overcomer that He's created you to be. Believers, I want us to close with a song this morning. And as we do that, would you find an altar of prayer? Let's believe the Lord to help us this morning as believers, as Christians, as Christ followers, to enjoy the rewards of the overcomer. Satan wants to steal those rewards from you. He doesn't want you to realize what God showed us in His Word today. But God wants you to walk in all the rewards of the overcomer. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, not by our own strength, not by some method of man or philosophy of man, but let's ask the Lord to help us be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Amen? And to uh, impact other people's lives around us as we're living that way. I want us to sing one more song before we close. Find a place of prayer. Respond to God's word this morning. Let him minister to you. And then we'll close together in prayer before we dismiss.
God, help us to be honest about the true condition of our heart. Lord, if we've been overcome by the world, by the flesh, by the devil, we've been beat up and we've been discouraged, God, I pray that we'll turn to you today and allow you by your word Allow you by your sacrifice, Jesus. Allow you by your Holy Spirit to help us to be the overcomers that you destined us to be. Lord, we want to live in all those nine rewards of the overcomer that we looked at in the book of Revelation today. We want to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. Lord, we want that to help us live in victory. We want also to spill over into the lives of our friends and our family so that they can be the overcomers that you want them to be as well. God, just teach us your ways today. God, help us to meditate on this word and to find ways that we can put it into practice this week. God, may we not be discouraged. May we not be beat down by the devil's lies. May we not be victims of his stealing, killing, and destroying. But God, may we be more than conquerors. May we be the overcomers that you want us to be. Lord, we pray for our church, for Finished Work Worship Center that this would be a church full of overcomers, a church of people who are making a difference for your glory in these last days. There's a great harvest of souls that needs to be brought in right here in Colorado Springs in the Pikes Peak region. Use us as your hands extended. Use us as instruments that you can flow through even this week. Lord, we'll just give you glory. Lord, bless us as we leave this place this morning. Help us uh, to stay close to you throughout this week to be uh, tools, instruments in your hand that you use for your work in these last days. We'll just give you glory and praise for all that's done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you.